tomorrow uh, here to Indiana University um, is uh, the there's a sort of a story about Peter Morrow, or a, a kind of a story about his uh, working with and dealing and, and directing the Han Bank in Mongolia. Uh, and this was a very important story, I think, also in general, from the point of view not just of, of, uh, of Mongolian business, but again, I think of business in general. This was a time of transition in Mongolia. And Han Bank, as you may know, is, stands for Hodil Ajakwain Nixing Bank. That's to say, the Bank of the Rural Collectives. Uh, and this was a, uh, the, the acronym makes the name Khan in Mongolia. In, in Mongolia. And this acronym uh, stood for, it was the bank that was for the various rural collectives in Mongolia, where the Mongolian, uh, Mongolian countryside was divided into rural collectives. Um, the story, at least as I've heard it, uh, is that it was during this time of transition, actually I should mention it to myself, Christopher Atwood, the chair of Century of this. I think you pretty much all know the uh, Mongolian thing. Um, and so the rural bank had branches in all of the rural collectives. And there was a real question as to what to do with this bank. This was a, a failing bank. Uh, Pete Morrow had been um, brought in as CEO of this new bank in 2000. Uh, and he was also, as after having initially led a World Bank and USAID program to restructure the bank. The question was though, what did, there's all these little rural branches and what to do with this bank. And uh, as I heard it, and maybe we'd we'll be able to ask uh, him about it, the, the question, the advice for a lot of people was, let's just, you know, fire everybody and restructure it, you know, eliminate all kinds of these little offices that aren't uh, of any, uh, of any use. Um, but Pete Morrow's idea was very different. That's your, that's what the base of this bank is. That's what this bank is about. It has branches everywhere throughout Mongolia. And so his program was to, no, to not, uh, to run it, not fire, not to, to fire everybody and immediately go for profit, but to restructure it in a way that would make long-term success. And that has been um, a that has been the result in Han Bank. Han Bank is now the largest uh, and most profitable Mongolian bank. Uh, but it managed to do so while not while sort of restructuring everything in a way that would you know, uh, cut back on all of the operations, but rather in a way that would uh, make its infrastructure serve and continue to serve in a new environment. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the story of, of uh, uh, Bank and Pete Morrow, you could say. And um, it's a real opportunity, real wonderful opportunity for us, those of you, many of you students in Mar Mongolia, to have him speak about uh, the current business environment in Mongolia. It's a real pleasure. I'd also like to, Indian University has a long uh, Mongolia Studies program. We also have on campus the Mongolia Society, which is an independent organization also housed in, uh, at Indian University. And uh, we'd like to present you, oh, uh, you. A, a copy of this Mongolia Studies, our journal, which is uh, from there. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Pete Morrow speak about the uh, business climate, current business climate in Mongolia. <coughs> Thank you all. Um, I've, uh, I've lived in Mongolia for the last 12 years. As uh, Chris mentioned, I came to be the CEO of what at the time was called the Agricultural Bank, became the Han Bank. Um, I retired from that two years ago after 10 years. Uh, retirement being a euphemism for you know, giving up the day-to-day, -day, finding a successor, giving up the day-to-day -day responsibility of doing things I wanted to do, which now includes organizing the American University of Mongolia, which what brings me here. Signed with your president, dean of the, of the business school, uh, a memorandum of understanding to start an executive MBA program uh, jointly between the American University of Mongolia and, and uh, Indiana University starting next next April. So uh, it's my my pleasure to chat here. Uh, I've been there 12 years. Uh, not a scholar. Uh, Woody Allen said 80% of life is showing up. Uh, I've been showing up in Mongolia now for 12 years. Uh, so I watched what's happened, and would like to share some of those, some of those ideas with you. Um, I also serve on a number of boards that are involved in the airline 
business telecommunications, property, property management, those sorts of things. So I, I am an observer of what's, what's going on in the country. A little history uh, is, is, is necessary. Um, as you all know, uh, some of you, I guess, are my goal studies students, and maybe not all of you are. But in March of, 2000, of 1990, uh, Mongolia had a Tiananmen Square moment uh, where the kids had been out in the plaza in front of the government house for six months. Uh, in a period of turmoil with the Berlin Wall coming down and, and serious change going on in the ex-USSR. Um, and the, uh, the government walked out of the government house and said, uh, okay, uh, you win, uh, we're now a democracy, we're now in the free markets, we're no longer communists. It, it happened literally that quick uh, and was the most extraordinary thing that hasn't been written up quite, quite enough. Uh, for 70 years prior to that, uh, Mongolia had been dominated by, by the USSR. They had gone uh, to the Russians, to the Russian Tsar in 1911, uh, when the Qing Empire broke up to get help in breaking away from the Manchus, China. Uh, and by the time the Russians got around to it, uh, the Tsar was gone and the communists were in power. A little known, little known uh, factoid, uh, trivia question if you will, the USSR was the first communist government of the world and, and Mongolia was, was the second. Um, before that, for 200 years, more or less, uh, it was uh, ruled by the, by the Manchus and the Qing Empire, which was a distinctly feudal uh, sort of uh, uh, period. I would probably, some of you know better than I, but doubtless more than 90% of Mongolians were herders at that time, those that weren't llamas, that is. Um, and under the Russians, more than 50% were, were nomadic herders as well. So underneath years of sort of a feudal uh, experience, and the communist experience was, was a uh, society that was nomadic. And that, that leads to certain, certain results that are, that are important today. So in 1990, uh, all of a sudden, Mongolia was part of the, it was a democracy, it was a democracy, it was part of the free markets, uh, and it had no practice, it had no previous experience. Many other uh, communist countries, such as uh, Romania, Poland, the Czech Republic, and others in Eastern Europe, uh, had been capitalist uh, economies before, had strong currencies, were exporters, were part of the Hanseatic League or the Heidelberg uh, cities, um, and, and had a history of private ownership, for example. Uh, but really had none of that. never had any private ownership, never had any, any uh, even nascent uh, <coughs> activity. So, cold turkey, um, democracy into the free markets um, in, in 1990. Uh, several things happened. First thing that happened, is the Russians went home. Uh, they pulled out. There was no reason for them to be there. Mongolia was essentially a military colony at that point. There were 400,000 Russian troops, uh, four 10,000 foot runways with MiGs and nuclear warheads in the Cold War, the Asian Cold War. We hear about the, the, uh, the Cold War in NATO and Russia, but the Asian Cold War were, uh, really drove the Russian presence there and they, they left. And somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of the GDP, whoever you talked to, went home with them. It just disappeared. All the factories that were supporting those, those soldiers uh, closed down, and it was uh, pretty grim uh, in, in Mongolia at the time. Uh, remember, this was a communist society before that, so 100% of the land and productive resources were owned by the state, uh, and the state had no money at that point to operate them. They were closed. It was uh, it was it was a grim time. Uh, the uh, second thing that happened is that Mongolia made a conscious decision to reform its political system before reforming its economic system. And that's the exact reverse of what happened in almost every other Asian country that came out of a period of profound change. Japanese after World War II, Koreans after the, after the Korean War, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, China, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, many other examples chose to keep a, a, a centralized political rule and reform the economy. So whether they're generals or strongman or communist party, uh, they could uh, bark orders in terms of making changes in the economy and building up productive capacity. Mongolia did it the reverse. Mongolia had a very strong sense because of its nomadic traditions of the independence and the integrity of each individual person. Uh, and they decided to go for a full democracy and later reform the economy. So they wrote a constitution. They brought in help from the US government and others. Germans especially, uh, to write laws, uh, to prepare regulations, to sort of build the things that you needed to build, 
in order to operate uh, in, in, in the free markets. Um, that uh, legal and administrative structure was not hard to do. You, in US AID, for example, funded a lot of consultants who came in and they wrote laws of various kinds. Uh, you can pass those laws, you can write regulations. But laws and regulations are part of it. Um, if you imagine a free market economy as a huge mosaic uh, with millions or billions of little tiles, the U.S. mosaic has been constructed over the last 200 years, especially over the last 100 years, uh, in terms of all kinds of different kinds of regulations and, and approaches to life. And it's not just laws and regulations, it's customs, it's practices, it's, it's beliefs, it's the way people interact and, and do business. Uh, that, isn't so, that isn't so easy uh, to generate. Uh, they broke the banking system, for example, into a classic two-tier system, where before it was a mono bank, it, that was the Soviet model, where it was one institution owned by the state that did everything. It was the current, uh, it issued the currency, it handled international transactions, it held savings deposits, it, it handled all the government's money. They broke that into two systems with a central bank, equivalent of our Federal Reserve Board, and then commercial banks under it who actually did uh, the loan and deposit business. Again, that was easy to do. You just write some, some laws and regulations and you break them up. It's a little harder to make those institutions work, but uh, there was no problem. They passed company law, uh, labor laws, uh, security laws, uh, various uh, uh, kinds of, of, of all the, the stuff that you need in order to be the underpinnings for, for a real free market economy. Uh, most importantly, a minerals law. In 1997, they passed with, again, World Bank financed help uh, what most people would say was a good minerals law. It was good for the country, it was good for potential investors, and would eventually attract uh, a great deal of investment. So they put that sort of legal and policy infrastructure in place. Um, and then the next thing that happened was a wave of privatization. Uh, the government uh, began to sell off the assets it owned, not just land and buildings, but businesses and, and uh, uh, you know, totally operating businesses. Uh, oops, excuse me. Uh, and Mongolians bought them. Uh, tended to be Mongolians who were entrepreneurial, uh, those who had been in the foreign service and spoke foreign languages and had some experience with people outside the country, who had, a, had, a, had enough knowledge to how you buy a business or run one or finance one. Uh, inevitably, these were uh, uh, folks in, in disproportionately who were involved in the previous government or whose parents were involved in the previous government. They were, for the most part, Insiders is not the right word, but they were people that had advantages over others. The privatization process was not pretty. It wasn't pretty in any <coughs> country converting from economy to free markets, and it wasn't in Mongolia. Uh, at the same time as part of that, there, there, there arose a, an um, entrepreneurs, if you will. And again, out of this nomadic lifestyle uh, came a, a spark of, of entrepreneurship, which is very common in Mongolia. Uh, a herder in many ways, even in a medieval uh, system of the Qing Dynasty or, uh, or under communism is, is really pretty entrepreneurial. If you're out there in your gear, 50 kilometers from the next family with your animals and your family and something breaks, you don't call a repairman. I mean, you deal with it. Uh, so they're very self-reliant sort of folks who, who figured that out, natural, natural traders. The current deputy prime minister uh, was in uh, going to school in Berlin uh, when, when all this happened in March of 1990, and the first thing he did was load up a train coupe. If you've been in one of the old Russian trains, he filled up a coupe with boots, and shoes, paid an average of 25 cents for each pair, and rode them to Mongolia and sold them, made some money, went back and did it again. That's how Mr. Terry Stock, who was currently our deputy prime minister, started his business career, uh, carrying boots from, from Germany to the U.S. And that story is repeated many, many times. The initial entrepreneurs in Mongolia were mostly what we call train traders. People jump on the train and go down to Erlian or Hohat or someplace in China or head up to Russia and buy stuff and bring it back and, and trade it. And from that, many of them have grown into quite, quite large business. So we did, in fact, generate an entrepreneurial class uh, that began to, to do business. But in the 90s, generally, uh, that was what was happening. Uh, there was almost no foreign investment. There was almost no interest in Mongolia uh, in those days. It was too early. Uh, the economy was not good. Uh, the institutions had not yet fully taken effect. There was inflation up to two or three hundred percent in uh, 07, excuse me, 97, 98, 99. There was food rationing parts of that time. Uh, times were uh, times were difficult. 
Um, 2000 may be a psychological break point, and I, maybe I'm just influenced by the fact that's when I showed up, but things started happening after 2000. Um, they, uh, they liquidated the banking system at the end of the 90s. The banking system basically failed uh, because bankers who, who had worked with the state bank back in the, in the 70s and 80s didn't have the equipment, didn't have the knowledge to actually manage a private sector bank, and most, most all of them failed. The uh, agricultural bank, which became Han Bank, was kept alive precisely because it had all these branches out in the countryside that were needed uh, to, to disperse pensions and collect taxes and, and things like that. In any event, uh, the banks picked up. The banks began to, to make more loans, to take deposits, to, to get active. Uh, the money supply was intermediated for the first time. That means the deposits were coming into the banks, the banks were lending it, and the borrowers put the money back in the banks that were lending. There's a multiplier effect for those of you who study economics, two or three times the value of those loans. Uh, whereas before, anybody who had cash kept it in their mattress and you know, maybe even loaned it themselves to their friends if they needed it. So uh, the, the, the commercial financing began to take off. The government, as I said earlier, managed this privatization process continuously. And while it wasn't perfect, uh, and there, were, there were certainly flaws and it wasn't a, totally transparent, uh, it worked. Uh, and that's 85% of all the assets in Mongolia today are in the hands of the private sector. It was 100%, of course, uh, in 1990. Um, one of the, perhaps the single most important thing uh, the government did was to privatize apartments. In 1997, uh, basically, basically almost all the apartments, certainly in central UB, were privatized to the residents. If you were living in one of those apartments, which of course were assigned by the government to you in the communist era, they just gave them to you for a nominal amount of money. Uh, that's, that created a sort of classic you know, Hernando de Soto situation uh, of creating value for e every Mongolian. Maybe 100 million, maybe 200 million US dollars at the time worth of value in those apartments. They could sell those apartments for cash and have cash. They could borrow against those apartments local banks. They could use those apartments to open uh, business. And those of you who are familiar with UB have been there. You know, the entire first floor apartments structure, the entire downtown area, is basically commercial establishments right now. It used to be apartments. Nobody knew that there was a difference in a first floor apartment and a second floor apartment until the prices of the first floor apartments quickly became 10 times the prices of the second floor apartments because, you know, pricing works, capitalism works. Uh, they were usable as, uh, as since retail uh, uh, outlets. So <clears throat> that, that gave, that, by privatizing those apartments, it instantly conveyed wealth uh, to, to, to virtually every family in, uh, in Ulaanbaatar and eventually the rest of the country as they privatized apartments uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, the, uh, the banking system probably grew 50% uh, compounded through the entire decade as, as this economy began to take off and people use those apartments and other assets to, to grow businesses, to start businesses, and, and, uh, and, and make things go. Uh, the entire gross domestic product GDP of Mongolia in 2000 was about one billion US dollars, uh, and it began to grow uh, eight to 10 percent a year, uh, every year from a small base, but nevertheless, that's very, very, uh, very significant growth. And in the early 2000s, uh, the miners arrived. Uh, really for the first time. Uh, Mongolia has incredible riches under the ground. Uh, it has gold and silver and copper and coal and iron ore and uranium and rare earths. It, it has everything. Uh, and everybody sort of intuitively assumed it had all those things. Uh, but it had never been really thoroughly explored. The Russians did some explorations, but the Russians had Siberia. They didn't need Mongolia. So, um, if you looked at a map uh, that had uh, depictions of minerals on it, Siberia is full of minerals, Inner Mongolia and China is full of minerals, and you know Mongolia is blank because it had never been studied. Uh, you know, God didn't forget Mongolia. It's, it's pretty obvious that underneath Mongolia was a continuum of all that incredible riches. And with a good mining law, uh, the miners started showing up, uh, 02, 03, 04, and sort of looking around and sniffing and trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, eventually, of course, they found things. They found a lot of things uh, and improving up deposits and a lot of money has flowed into Mongolia to, 
to, uh, to, to, to check that, that, that mining out, and some of it has now become operating mines or nearly operating mines of significance. Uh, that brought on a political debate uh, because uh, Mongolians weren't familiar with large scale mining. The only mine of consequence in, in Mongolia uh, was the Erdenet mine, which is a joint venture of the Mongolian and Russian governments, which is you know, sort of an institutional thing, part of the government. Nobody looked at that as a, a real business. Uh, and then a lot of small riparian operators who were out there with dredges in the rivers uh, mining for gold, which was an ugly business. It was, it was destroying the environment. It was quite difficult. Uh, there wasn't anything good about mining that most Mongolians, the average Mongolians, could see. Plus, they worried about uh, why do we need foreigners in here? Uh, if foreigners come in and, and dig up our stuff, uh, will we see the benefit of it? Or will they just take it all out of the country? Or will Mongolian politicians? You know, be the ones that profit from all of this. And how do how do how do the people uh, uh, profit from this? And of course, the um, not only being a democracy, there are plenty of politicians to play that card who, who, who took the, the resource nationalism or nationalist sort of approach uh, to politics and, and stirred that up. So there became opposition to mining, uh, and it was rather controversial. And um, there were uh, you know demonstrations, all the things you find in a democracy, and lots of political agitation. There were some changes in the law that were unfortunate. They were overreactions to the situation. Uh, some changes were necessary, but they, they went a bit too far, which, is, which has been reversed. Uh, in any event, um, in the elections that happened uh, at that point, uh, uh, it was uh, contested in a sense that we have had between 2004 and, and 2012 essentially coalition governments that entire period. In some cases, with two major parties, very close votes. In some cases, not so close, but they still decided to be a coalition. So you had the two major parties operating essentially as, a, as an unopposed government uh, for, for the last eight years. But within that structure, uh, considerable opposition to mining, particularly by, by foreign companies. Now, despite all that, uh, the first major project got underway uh, in 2009, it, it brewing for several years, but finally approved, which is the Oyu Togoi Copper Deposit. It's the second largest deposit of copper in the world. And uh, Rio Tinto Corporation of London and Australia, which is the second largest mining company in the world, is developing that mine. They're spending $7 million a day, uh, eventually a total of six or seven billion US dollars in developing that project. Uh, They've spent so far one billion U.S. dollars in Mongolia on wages and local purchases of suppliers, and there's a multiplier effect on that. It's estimated they're, they're currently contributing as much as 40 percent of the GDP in Mongolia. It's very, very, uh, it's a very large project with a large uh, impact uh, on the country. It's, it's it's the first major project, and by itself is is uh, is significant. Um, I, as well, four years ago, Mongolia exported uh, very little coal, almost nothing. And there was, as late as the summer, six coal mines exporting this year about $3 billion U.S. dollars worth of coal. Now remember, the Mongolian economy 10 years ago was only $1 billion. And last year was about $2 billion of, of coal exports. This year will be $3 billion of coal exports. We don't know about next year yet. Because the Chinese have slowed down the buying of coal, and those mines are currently not selling Coal. So it's been a huge increase and it's impacted 2011 and 2012. Probably will be back and, and be very large in 2013, but it's right now uh, there are no exports of coal because it's been temporarily stopped because of Chinese slowing down. <coughs> There's a continual risk for Mongolia in terms of, of the Chinese demand for its stuff. In any event, between Oyu Togoi spending a lot of money on these, these coal exports, the Mongolian economy in the last two or three years has grown. Pick your number. If the official number is close to 20%. It's more likely closer to 30% or something very, very uh, rapid. Uh, as a result of particularly those two things, OT and coal, but also there's iron ore exports and there's other things going on in Mongolia and all the ancillary supply chains supplying these people, um, the economy is in boom time, uh, frankly. The current GDP is about 10 billion US. Expected to be closer to 12 next year. That's up from 1 billion. The per capita income, depending on how you want to count it, was about $400 per person 10 years ago. It's about uh, between 3,500 and 4,000 now. Uh, that has impacted all levels. Uh, 
the World Bank has put out some studies showing that day laborers, the lowest lowest earner of, of all uh, workers in Mongolia, the day laborers who work just at, at blue collar jobs that are picked up in the mornings, uh, wages are up 50% from last year. Uh, and certainly in the middle classes, upper middle classes, the demand for, for educated Mongolians has skyrocketed. Uh, so the wages are, are, are way up. Uh, anecdotally, uh, when I arrived in, uh, in Mongolia in 2000, the highest paid person in the bank, there were six of them, were the highest paid people in our bank of 800 people, third largest bank in Mongolia, made $72 a year, uh, 80,200. Those of you who know that. Uh, today, uh, probably we have 75 people making, I want to say, 48,000, somewhere in that range. Uh, and we have 4,500 employees up from 800. Uh, now, the difference is $72 a month, uh, which is not enough to own a car or live in an apartment, unless you're with parents or eat in a restaurant or anything else. Today, with those higher <coughs> income employees, especially if they have a spouse, which most do, most, most couples are two income families, uh, these people are buying you know, nice apartments and, and, and new cars, and eating in restaurants from the bottom of the line on the table. It's, it's, it's this upper middle class Mongolian development that has really driven the, the retail uh, expansion and, and, and the housing boom that we've uh, experienced uh, experience in Mongolia. So it's been, uh, it's been quite, a, quite a situation. By the way, a teller today makes uh, $500 to start and up to $700 uh, on after that. So compared with what it was 10 years ago, just anecdotally, and Hanbank's not alone. I mean, all other employers are competing for the same pool. Uh, there's been an incredible increase in income. And you see it around the streets. Those of you who've been to the Lund Bader, you see Louis Vuitton and Hermes and then, uh, Burberry and those kind of stores. But you also see a whole array of sort of more middle, upper middle class stores selling important stuff. You see all kinds of, of new restaurants with all kinds of food uh, that some of them are extremely uh, expensive. Uh, the banks, as I mentioned earlier, grew an average of 50% compounded through uh, the 10 years of 2000 to 2010. Hon Bank actually grew a little bit faster than that. Uh, in 2011, uh, the system grew almost 70% on bank, which is, is a proxy for the grassroots of Mongolia because we do business in those 500 offices, as Chris mentioned, all over the, the country. Grew 80% in loans, and the biggest demand was out in the countryside among small loans and pensioners and salaried people and small business people. So, you know, the, the trickle down, at least in Mongolia, works. Whether it works here or not is a political issue. Uh, for example, I said on, a, on an airline, uh, a board of an airline that uh, it's, it's charter business, which is flying to mining companies, which as you would imagine is, is a booming business. Uh, in 2010, it was up 50%. In 2011, it was up 250%. percent probably be up more than that this year. These are stories that, they're anecdotal, but people can tell these stories all around Mongolia in terms of the level of sales, profits, uh, business activity uh, that's, uh, that, that's going on. Um, so, what... Uh, when you ask what uh, this, this the title of this talk, I think it was past, present, and future. I got you up to the present. So what does uh, what does the future look like? Uh, as I mentioned, there is considerably more resource nationalism right now in Mongolia. Uh, the two major parties, uh, the uh, what used to be the Communist Party uh, and used to be known as the MPRP, now known as the NPP, are the traditional lead party of Mongolia, except for a brief period of time. I've been power since 1990, really, uh, and the Democrats, which, uh, loosely speaking, were the folks out in the street who were leading the revolution in 1990 and formed a group of parties that are now coalesced in one party called the Democratic Party. Those folks have, between them, won substantially all the parliament seats in the last several elections. Uh, I think there are uh, maybe five or six independents right now in the parliament, and the rest are between those those two parties. There is no ideological difference in those two parties that, that I can figure out. Uh, they're both centrist. Uh, they both move to more resource nationalism, to more nationalists, to thinking about mining and foreign investment. Uh, but they're, uh, they're both uh, quite practical in other ways. And there really isn't any way to find, as far as I know, an ideological difference between those guys. Um, they all recognize the need for mining and mining revenues, to build Mongolia's economy, to reduce poverty, to, to 
create wealth for the country for its citizens. They all understand that perfectly well. At the same time, they understand there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a rather widespread sentiment out in the country among the voters uh, to question mining and to question whether uh, foreign investment is the right way uh, to, to do this. So at the same time, you have um, you can sit down as a business person with many of these political leaders and have a rational discussion about what to do about mining and probably agree with you. And then if you put a television microphone in their face, it's, uh, it's let's get these foreigners out of here. So there's a little bit of a schizophrenia going on between you know what's being played to the public and, and what the public is, is feeling about the mining in Mongolia and how, how the government uh, is, is, is actually thinking about it. So that's a bit of a, of a, of a problem right now. I think it's slowed down in a number of ways, uh, new money coming in, uh, slowed down new developments in mining. We'll have to see what happens over the next uh, year or two. But frankly, so much of the current growth of Mongolia is, is de-risked in the sense that it just, it's going to happen and there's not much that can get in its way. Uh, I don't think the Chinese will not buy coal in the next year or two. There's a temporary right now shutdown of that. The Chinese need coal. They desperately need coke and coal for all the steel they need to make. Even if the growth slows from 10 to 8 to 6 or whatever percent per, uh, per annum, uh, they're going to need coal. Uh, the Tolloy is almost finished. Uh, it's about 90% built and we'll start exporting copper in January. Uh, so these things will go forward. These things by themselves will drive continual, fast economic growth. The question is how fast? How many new mining initiatives get off the ground in the next year or two or three? Uh, hard to tell. Next, in terms of volume, would be the Tomatel Roy, which is the second largest coking coal deposit in the world, that perhaps PVD Coal, perhaps in a consortium with the Xinhua Coal Company in China, uh, these, these are being talked about. There's you know, discussions going back with the government and other companies and you know, Chinese and, and uh, Taiwanese, excuse me, uh, uh, Korean, Japanese, uh, Russian investors, potential investors uh, in that big project. Uh, Mongolia has the fourth largest uh, deposits of you know, uranium in the world, huge deposits of iron ore, uh, and there are these various developments out there that are that are looking uh, looking to happen. Uh, I would say that in all of this, what I'm describing to you is what what in the investment world is is called a frontier market. Uh, it's not really a developing market yet, uh, in terms of that lexicon. It's a frontier market. It's high risk, high reward. Uh, you can make uh, a lot of money because there's a lot of potential and there's, there's a lot of growth that's happening. On the other hand, the judicial system is not fully mature. Uh, it's, uh, especially for a foreign investor, it's, uh, you can't rely on the court system to give you a, a transparent result in, in a dispute, especially with local Mongolia. Uh, so it's high risk. You have to be careful and you have to start to think you know, properly, but uh, nevertheless, certainly, uh, certainly high reward. <coughs> in the future is not just mining. Um, in the future is uh, infrastructure. Uh, up to now, uh, power, for example, electricity and heat has been considered a government function. Uh, and only the government today, throughout Mongolia, every place, not a single kilowatt hour of electricity, not a single calorie of heat is distributed uh, that is not produced by the government. That will end uh, in about three months uh, when uh, uh, there's a, a wind farm, a 50 megawatt wind farm that will come online. It's being developed by Newcom. Uh, and that will provide about 5% of UV's electricity. It's 100% privately owned uh, by Newcom by uh, the General Electric Company and some, some institutional lenders. Um, uh, the government at long last, after a long delay, has awarded a contract for power plant number five, which will be the latest power plant, the first one built since 1984 in Ulaanbaatar. That will, that will address and solve the sort of intermediate term uh, demand for electricity and heat in Mongolia, which is being rationed right now. There are, there are brownouts in the, in the wintertime. That will be a, a privately owned power plant under a PPP, a public-private partnership. It would revert to the government after 30 years, but meanwhile will be organized, managed, funded uh, by, by the private sector. Uh, Rio Tinto has received permission uh, to uh, commission a power plant at its, uh, 
and so you told by Copper Project, which he will own, also probably a public-private partnership with PPP, but it will be privately owned. So all of a sudden, power has gone from something that's 100% government utility in effect uh, to something that will be close to 50% privately owned and operated, uh, which in terms of efficiencies and, and long-term <coughs> health of that system is, uh, is, is terrific. Uh, same with the railroads. The railroads are 100% uh, owned by the government uh, and or the government and Russia, the joint venture of the UV Railroad. Uh, the next railroad on the drawing boards will carry a lot of this coal and copper from the Gobi Desert into China. It's going to be a, a privately owned railroad developed by one of the companies. Again, most likely a public-private partnership, so it will be operated privately for 30 years and then the government has the right to take it over, whether it does or not, 30 years. Who knows? Uh, recently, until recently, we had one, one airline going, one international airline, and uh, until a few years ago, one airline flying at all. That was me at the national airline. Uh, we now have three airlines flying in Mongolia, two private airlines with me at international and domestic. Uh, and that market is growing very substantially. Two years ago, there were no flights from UB to Hong Kong. You couldn't imagine it. Last year, there were two flights a week to Hong Kong. This year, there's seven flights a week to Hong Kong. They're mostly full two different airlines, so that, that whole sector is, is growing. Um, the, uh, the stock exchange was um, a never a serious stock exchange. The stock exchange in Mongolia was created in the early 1990s, not to raise money, not to trade stocks, uh, but to facilitate privatization of businesses. So Mongolia would take uh, parts of its state-owned enterprise and they would give shares away to the public or to the workers or neighbors or somebody. Uh, and then they would simultaneously list them on the stock exchange so those people could, could, could trade the shares and, and create some value out of it. Uh, but it never really functioned as a transparent <coughs> stock exchange. The government spent, um, uh, over the last uh, two years, it spent $14 million uh, hiring the London Stock Exchange to refurbish the Mongolian Stock Exchange. They had new technology, new procedures, new operating ways to where the Mongolian Stock Exchange will become a full functioning uh, international standard stock exchange, which will create a securities industry, which will create jobs and development for, for everything from stock brokers to investment bankers to, to, to workers who, who, who support all of that. So that's, a, that's an important development, I think, uh, economically. Um, and of course, the university we're bringing up is, is, is a piece of that. We're bringing that university up, American University, and the style of American universities abroad, American accredited style of edu ed education. Um, precisely uh, to meet the needs of such a rapidly changing country to train uh, in a little art style uh, as well as hard skills uh, for, for, for the kinds of skills that Mongolia is going to need in this rapidly uh, growing environment, which of course will create jobs and income. It's a form of import substitution in the sense that, you know, for the most part our students will be folks who might have gone out, out, of, out of the country otherwise, gone someplace else to study for a comparable uh, type education. So, it's a piece of, little piece of infrastructure development of our own. Uh, and behind all of that, behind the mining companies and behind this infrastructure, is a supply chain. Uh, and the supply chain being everything from world-class law firms, of which several have now opened up offices at UB to service the needs of uh, investors, uh, to all four of the big four accounting firms, uh, which none have the offices maybe two or three years ago, they're all four there now, uh, to the whole varieties of sellers of goods and services who are moving in to take advantage of, of what's happened uh, in, uh, in Mongolia. Michael Porter of the Harvard Business School wrote an article a couple of years ago, did a study and published it, it's on his Harvard Business School website, basically saying that, that Mongolia has within its potential to become a regional mining supply uh, capital for, for, for all of Asia. Uh, that it would be a place where uh, companies would put branch offices or businesses uh, that would inventory uh, products uh, and sell products and services uh, around Asia. Because it's a democracy, you don't have some of the same risks if you go into Russia or China. Uh, and uh, we have such a large mining industry that's, uh, that's getting underway that we'll have the skills, and we'll have the products, and we'll have the ability uh, to do that, uh, to become a regional center. Uh, the airline I'm on the board of has signed an agreement with ANA, all Nippon Airways of Japan, to develop UV into a transportation hub, an airline hub. Now, that, if you told me that five years ago, I'd laugh at you. But the fact is, if you look at a map 
uh, you see that there's no Star Alliance member between uh, Seoul and Frankfurt. Uh, now, if you want to put a hub in, say, Central Asia or Northeast Asia between those cities, where do you put it? Do you put it in Kazakhstan, you put it in Turkmenistan, or Azerbaijan? I mean, uh, it, it, Mongolia is a pretty good place for that. Uh, right now, if you're a Korean company and you do business in Vladivostok, uh, or, or say, uh, Irkutsk in Siberia, you fly to Russia and fly back. If you're a German businessman in, Fra in Frankfurt and you want to go to Urumqi, which has now been officially designated as the coal capital of China, uh, you fly to Beijing and fly back five hours. So there really is no good hub. It's never going to be China, because uh, China doesn't want a hub. Uh, but there's no really good hub there that's entirely possible. So what I'm, what I'm describing is, is a scenario where the mineral wealth, <coughs> in fact, begets and pays for infrastructure, uh, and both of them together uh, pay for and beget a supply chain of, of uh, both Mongolian uh, and foreign entities who want to sell things uh, to, to, to support all this development, which is the mining itself plus the infrastructure and plus everything that accumulates and feeds on itself. So it, it's a major business opportunity. So I guess the future uh, on the plus side is this huge growth. Um, the stuff is there. All, the, you know, all these commodities in the ground are there. We know that. Uh, they can be sold. Uh, and they can create enormous growth, which can fuel all that infrastructure uh, and fuel uh, the, the supply chain and create immense big business opportunities, really, for, for people who, who, who have the appetite. And the reason I say you have to have the appetite is, is the risks. As a frontier economy, uh, it's, uh, you have this potential upside that you also have exposures. So what are those? If people ask me what I worry about, uh, you might go, I've been there 12 years. Uh, it's my permanent home. Uh, what, what do I worry about? I'm an optimist. Uh, you worry about uh, the, the pace of change and whether or not uh, the government and the institutions can manage that. Uh, you worry about corruption. You worry about whether or not the huge money that the government is potentially can take from this mine in the form of royalties taxes, uh, dividends, because it owns the government, is scheduled to own a chunk of virtually every significant mine in Mongolia. It's huge. But what do they do with it? I mean, are we Norway or Chile or Kuwait? Are these, these monies intelligently invested in Mongolian infrastructure and uh, offshore investments for the future? Uh, because if you just dig stuff out of the ground and then spend the money and give it to the citizens to buy vodka with or whatever, which is what's been happening uh, in the election cycles, the last two of them, uh, you don't gain anything. Uh, but if you take it out of the ground and you create an asset that, that replaces the asset you've taken out of the ground in the form of either international stocks or bonds or uh, bridges and roads and schools and, and infrastructure assets in Mongolia, you know, you've done something. So are we going to do that? Are we going to be Mongolia? Excuse me, are we going to be Norway or Chile or whatnot uh, who manages those assets well in their own countries? Or you know, the worst example in the world is Nigeria, a, a country where people have basically taken all that wealth and either waste that they're stolen. Uh, so I worry about how that's managed. I'm an optimist. I, I think Mongolia's last two governments have been, for the most part, young. Uh, I mean, even the old guys in politics today are 50. Uh, but they've been a, a group of younger people uh, who, who get it, most of them Western educated, uh, and, and who have mostly the right ideas. Uh, we're a parliamentary democracy. Not all of the 76 members of that Parliament that votes and creates the government, and creates the policies. Not all of them uh, are, are young or well educated or get it. Uh, so, you know, there'll be uh, three steps forward, sometimes a step or two back, in my judgment. Uh, but uh, ultimately, they'll get there. But that's a risk. That's a risk uh, that I see for sure. Uh, the other major risk is, let's call it the geopolitical risk, is it only sits between those two countries, of, of China and Russia. And they have done a superb job of managing the relationships in both cases. Uh, they've managed Russia very well. Uh, Russians have essentially no substantive impact on Mongolia. They haven't made any investments for years. Mr. Putin and Mr. Medvedev have both been there in the last two or three years more than once. Uh, and there's, Mongolia has the ability simply uh, to manage. And nothing serious has happened as a, as a consequence. So, you know, we're, we're across the border from Russia, but not really. We're across the border from Siberia. You know, we're 6,000 kilometers from Moscow, so I mean, we're as far from Moscow as we are from most cities in Europe. 
So it's, it's not like we're Georgia, or it's not like we're someplace that the, the, the Russian uh, folks have a, have a reason to, to be threatened by or do something untoward. So um, they've managed that situation and, and well, and, and you could be, I think, fairly optimistic about it. The Chinese are different. The Chinese are different everywhere. I mean, the Chinese behavior in the world generally has changed substantially in the last two or three years, as, as we've all observed, especially with its neighbors. It's the 12 or 13 countries that border China all have the same uh, concerns right now about what China's objectives are. 92% of Mongolia's exports go to China. Uh, I mean, that's an astounding uh, dependency on one market. Uh, Mongolia is exploring the idea of running a railroad up north and out through Vladivostok, through this Trans-Siberia, as an alternative, but that's totally uneconomic. It makes no sense economically. It makes sense geopolitically, and then we'll probably do it. Um, but um, the Chinese uh, are beginning to be more and more insistent on what they want out of Mongolia, um, and that's, uh, that's just a, a constant problem Mongolia has to work with. Uh, they don't like the Chinese, uh, in part historically, because of uh, the history between the two countries. You know, Chinese build a wall one or several walls to keep the Mongolians out. Um, but more because of the way they see the Chinese government behaving in, in Tibet, in Xinjiang, and in Mongolia, where, where there's a clear policy of assimilation uh, and subsuming of the minority groups. Mongolia is 2.7 million people. You know, looks out at 1.3 billion people, uh, and that scares them. Uh, that's, that's the, 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 the Chinese, the Chinese are the elephant in the room of almost every discussion that happens in the world, it's economic, political, legal, whatever it is. Uh, because of that, that conundrum, the incredible need and the incredible opportunity to have a market that size on your border that you can sell things to and realize you know, tremendous income and economic growth at the same time, uh, the threat uh, that it's uh, posing. So, so I'd say, you know, the, the way in which the government chooses to handle this largesse and to manage it all, and I say manage it from managing the money and intelligently investing it and dealing with it transparently and also taking care of the environment, taking care of the cultural change issues that are coming is, uh, is, is a risk I worry about and, and how, how they cope with the Chinese as, as, the, as the economy ramps up and the wealth ramps up in, in Mongolia is another one. So uh, I guess the, the, the punchline in terms of the future, the Mongolian economy, as I said, I'm an optimist. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's going to continue to grow rapidly. I think the government will get it figured out, uh, not easily, not on a straight line, not perfectly, but we'll eventually get it figured out uh, and, and manage it uh, properly, and that therefore Mongolians should enjoy continuously increasing levels of income and wealth, and it should become uh, a good and improving uh, opportunity for foreign investors and Mongolian investors to put their money up and profit from all this, uh, but with risks. So think, think frontier. I think high risk, uh, high reward. That's that's where we've been the last few years, and that's where we'll be in the next few years. With that, I will stop and uh, take questions. Uh, it's more fun for me to respond to what you want to talk about. <coughs> you try to decide what you want to talk about. Please. Yeah. Right, uh, first of all, thank you for giving all this great piece of information. Thank you so much. My question is: Are you talking about this uh, American university in uh, Mongolia? So can you give us some more information on that? Yeah, a group of um, Mongolian and American businessmen, five of each, got together a couple of years ago uh, with a proposal we had from some folks who were involved in other American universities and suggested that Mongolia is the next logical place for, for such, a, such a university. And we thought about it. We commissioned a feasibility study. And it uh, seemed like a, like a good idea. Mongolia produces 34,000 graduates undergraduate graduates a year from its universities. We don't intend to replace that or challenge that or compete with that in any sense. And we're going to start with 200 incoming freshmen, we hope, in 2014. Uh, but there are needs that Pavilion has that are not being met locally. And because we're new, because we're Greenfield, uh, we can decide, uh, listen to, to the demand and, and decide what makes sense. Um, our notion is we're the fastest growing country in the world, but we'll continue to be. It is a strategically important country, a democracy sitting in a very unfriendly neighborhood, if you will. It's worth, worth supporting and protecting if you're the United States government, European government, Japan. Uh, it's, uh, 
it's, a, it's, it's this fast growing country where the growth is high risk. It's high risk growth because it's resource led and it has all the potential that I just talked about for, for going wrong, for uh, things not working out uh, properly. And it's going to take a lot of educated citizenry to make it work. I'm not worried about Rio Tinto getting, mine, uh, getting stuff out of the ground and selling it. They can figure that out. Uh, what I am worried about is how do we manage the environmental risks that happen? Who's going to staff the NGOs and government entities that need to look after the environment? Who's going to worry about the cultural change that happens? You know, what happens to a nomadic herder who move him and his family into the you know, fifth floor apartment you know, in, a, in a town near a mine site and teach him to be a welder? You know, what happens to, to, to spousal abuse and child abuse rates? What happens to alcoholism? What happens to the cultural and societal aspects when you, when you have that change, especially if it's a fast change? The evidence is not good with a tremendous number of Mongolians who've moved in to the, to the, to the ring around Ulan Bader as well as Darhan Erdenet. Uh, there, there, there are significant social issues in those communities. So I worry about that, uh, uh, those, those things that, uh, that, that in fact that can happen. So it, it takes, it takes a certain way of, of, of thinking about the world to solve that. So that's why we're, we're bringing up this university as a liberal arts school. We'll teach hard skills because not only families want their kids to get hard skills, they want their kids to be engineers or accountants or whatever, to be able to get good jobs. But on the other hand, they have to be able to think critically uh, and, and, and to communicate and, and to you know, think in a broader context, which you get from, from liberal arts in, in, in our view. It's not just training engineers for a mining company, it's training engineers who can think about how mining relates to the rest of society and staff, you know, the NGOs and government entities that need to regulate and, and be concerned with those things. So that's a slice, you know, that we're aiming our sights at in terms of bringing up the university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, according to the traditional Mongolian view, the Mongolian people are possible mine in Mongolia were exploited and became a mine, the total number of hectares that that involves is tiny in terms of the size of Mongolia. Because mines aren't that big. Even a huge mine like Hoyutogoi takes up a few hundred hectares, which is a, is a tiny part of everything else. So it's, it's certainly possible uh, for, for mining and, 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 and herding and, and, and the pastures, as, as far as that matter goes, tourism uh, and preserving the beauty of the landscape and the countryside for those both to happen. Uh, is it necessary that they're both gonna happen? Could, could they screw it up? Could, could mining be out of control? I think it depends on who's doing the mining. I think uh, if you have responsible international companies that are properly regulated, uh, okay, I don't worry about Rio Tinto. I mean, they're, they're under a lot of pressure worldwide to, to do the right thing in terms of the economy and in terms of the environment. Uh, I worry about if one of these major mines are run by the, by the Chinese or the Russians, for example, who don't have those sorts of so I guess an early warning sign for all of this, whether it's transparency and proper handling of the money or environmental issues, would be who's the government picking as their partners? Who, who, what's the quality level of these people coming in? Uh, I guess your question also involves sort of a, almost a, a philosophical point, is that, is that in, in, a, in, a, in a shamanist sense, or the, which has been incorporated in today's Tibetan so Buddhism, is it somehow doing violence to the land somehow or the whole concept of being a Mongolian? you know, to dig this stuff up. Um, not for me to say, I mean, I'm a foreigner. My wife's a Mongolian, my kid's a Mongolian, but I'm a foreigner. So I wouldn't presume to tell Mongolians, don't dig this stuff up, because if they don't dig it up, I don't know what other source there is of wealth and revenue to reduce poverty, increase incomes, and have people become prosperous. I just don't know. But in the end, Mongolians have to decide. I mean, there is a logic, and there is certainly arguments that are made. Let's don't dig it up. Let's leave it down there for our kids and grandkids and future generations. If you do that, you're going to have a few generations of continued poverty you know, until you get where. I'm not sure where you get. Essentially, you know, eventually you have to dig it up if you're going to get any wealth out of it. So that's, that's a philosophical question I can't answer. But I think Mongolians have said pretty clearly, even though there's more resource nationalism now, 
they've said pretty clearly through the process that, yeah, we want to do this stuff. We want the jobs. We want the business that comes you know, with this mining stuff coming out. The trick is, how do, you, how do you have both? How do you preserve the lifestyle, preserve the beauty of the, of the countryside? And, you know, it's, the way you do it, I give a speech you know, on that subject to Mongolia, especially Mongolian kids. The way you do it is pay attention. Vote. You know, watch what your government is doing and don't let them go out and allow mining to screw up the beauty of the country and screw up the possibilities for tourism and, and offend you know, Mongolian sensibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned how the judicial system is in Mongolia is developed and, and how the big four this came in recently and has been tested. Uh, how do you see the stock market developing? Do you see by people having trust in the market, even though the sectors <coughs> are as developed? Good question. Um, I, it, it, I, I was, when the prime minister who drove this, previous prime minister, Bob Bull, who's a businessman, uh, and a sophisticated man, his MBA at the University of Washington, he decided that he wanted to build capital markets in Mongolia to support for people, and he's right and to remediate the Mongolian Stock Exchange. And at his request, several of us were put on the board to help do that. I was the vice chairman for a couple of years in the Stock Exchange. And my point was, when people ask the question, is it's like, it's like, uh, it's like Field of Dreams. It's if you build it, they might come. Um, if you don't build it, they can't come. That's the point. So was it smart to spend $14 million with the Mongolian Stock Exchange to make a world-class stock exchange? We'll see. It's not just technology. You know, the computers and all the stuff and the rules and regulations. You can write all that down and you can buy that, and we did buy that from the London Stock Exchange. Um, but if you have effective regulation, only if you have effective regulation, you know, effective management of the process, you know, does it work? The real key there's no problem in getting listings, there's no problem finding stocks to trade. All of the major investors who are in our building, whether it's Rio Tinto or BHP or South Nobi Sands, all these investors want to list on a Mongolian stock exchange because they want to sell their stock to Mongolians because they want Mongolians to, to own their stock and feel like you know they're a they're a, they're a stakeholder and not just you know some sort of wary observer. The trick is will people come buy stocks? Uh, is it a place where people will trust the market, trust the rules? Uh, will fund managers in London or Hong Kong or New York uh, come in and open an account with a brokerage house in Mongolia and buy stocks? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I hope. But you know, my position was, government, if you get an extra 14 million, fine. Um, if you build it, they might come. I, I think we'll see. If you don't build it, they won't. The, the way it was before, it was impossible. Yes? I, got, <clears throat> I should like to ask, who works in the mines now? Because there was mining in the early 20th century in Mongolia, obviously, the heavy mining near the capital. And then later, mostly Kazakhs worked in the mines. Mm -hmm. Who are the workers now? Yeah, there they, they were, they were Mongols of Kazakh derivation uh, for the most part. Yeah, they put them out in Nalik and they put them up in Erdogan, absolutely. Um, the only significant mine that has operated in the last 30 years in Mongolia has been the Erdogan mine, which is a joint venture of Mongolia and, uh, and, and, and Russia. And the workers up there are mostly Mongolians. There are a number of executives and higher level people that are Russians, and, and, and they did move quite a lot of Kazakhs up there, but they're Mongolians, so they're Mongolian citizens who are Kazakhs, but by Adobe ultimately. <coughs> uh, but that's mostly a Mongolian operation. Boro Gold opened the first new mine, the first new mine uh, of the new era in 2003. And the employees there, as far as I know, are 100% Mongolian. Uh, they've had labor problems because They've had disputes with the government, they've been back and forth, they've had to lay people off, they've had strikes. It's been a problem, but it's 100% Mongolia. There's no mining yet at Ogotogoi. There's 15,000 people working at Ogotogoi building the mine. And the number they put out, which, which I, I tend to believe, because I don't think Rio could, could lie and not get into big trouble, is it's 60% Mongolia. Uh, and the rest uh, are Chinese subcontractors. Because we don't have welders and, 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 and electricians and plumbers, we don't have a trained vocational workforce yet. So there's a lot of subcontractor Chinese uh, working down there, but it still is 60% Mongolian, uh, is, what, is what they said. 
they have a requirement under their investment agreement at OT to have 90% Mongolian employment at all levels at, at OT once it's built to operate. I think they have four or five years to get there. So they are investing their budget for higher education and training for the next two years is 125 billion US dollars. So they are serious about finding Mongols at all levels, managers as well as you know as blue collar workers uh, to fill those positions because the law requires them to have 90 working to it. So we'll see. The, the government has been putting that clause in the most of its agreements. Whether it works, you know, we'll have to see. What you don't want is is if you're not able to find enough models, and frankly, we're, we're a bit like Kuwait and Abu Dhabi and everybody else, you don't want to wind up with all Filipinos, you know, or all Chinese, in the case of Mongolia, is right working in your minds. Uh, but that's what's happened in much of, much of the Gulf, uh, because they don't have the labor. So, you know, you hope they can get enough trained to have the Mongolians working those jobs, because the alternative is not pretty. Well, uh, I, I didn't touch on that, it's, it's, but it's not insignificant, so-called ninja miners. <coughs> uh, there are approximately, uh, last I checked, 100,000 uh, illegal miners. These are Mongolians, many of them are herders who, who failed, who, who were unemployed, who go in to, to, to go into mining. And there's two kinds of them. One kind is the riparian or the river miners. And these guys go out along the rivers, especially the Tool River out in, in western uh, and they go in and they, they have these green pans that they carry on their backs, which is why they refer to the Ninja Turtles, Michelangelo and Donatello and all those guys. Um, and what they do is, is horrify. Uh, they move into these communities that are really gare slums uh, with their families, and they dig a shaft with, say, a meter square down 20 meters. It's not reinforced. And the guy goes down on a bucket with a rope, fills it up, with chat and sand, brings it up to the top, and then they drill another one five meters away, and then they connect the two at the bottom. Uh, the last year I was down there, which would have been in 07 or 08, 19 people had been buried alive doing that. Uh, I mean, it's incredibly uh, uh, dangerous. And then the kids carry this chat down to a nearby river or, or lake, and, and, and the wives are all down there panning the stuff. And out of a huge pan, they spend all day long, they get five or six little flakes of gold. Um, they can make a living at it. There's no law enforcement. Uh, this, these communities are basically slums. They've got shallow wells, they've got pit toilets, they've got gear brothels and gear bars and fights. And, and the, the local authorities, the local Sum, uh, Zamar Sum, which is the center of all this, uh, don't have any police, they don't have any money. Uh, it, it's a horrible scene from a social standpoint. Uh, the other kind of ninja miners is worse, uh, is they up north, they're up on the Boro River near between Tuov and Salingi. And this is an area where there was an estimated 10 tons of mercury spilled in the Soviet era. The rivers are covered with mercury, you go down to the bottom of them like, like this. And the, the miners go down and they pull up this mercury with their hands, put it in their pockets, they got their kids out there, their animals are drinking out of this river, right? Uh, and they bring this mercury back, and they bring back hard rock. This is hard rock gold, where they, they just dig down and they pull it up. They put the mercury with it and they heat it. They take it into their gear and they put it on a stove, and they, and they heat this mercury, and the fumes and the vapors go up, and then it rains and it all comes down on top of it. In 2003, JICA, the Japanese uh, in, uh, uh, Development Agency, uh, did a study, and they recommended that three complete sum centers be moved immediately. The level of birth defects and cancer in these areas is skyrocketing because they're basically ingesting you know, this mercury in all of its forms. Incredibly, the Mongolian government does not have the political will to stop it or regulate it. There's 100,000 voters, plus their spouses, so there's 200,000 voters. Uh, that's all they have to do. And, and Jack had quoted these people, it's, it's really, it's horrifying, as saying, well, we know it's not good for us, but we have no choice. Well, they don't know how bad it is for them, I suspect. But it's a, it's a horrible thing that's going on, and they do not have the willpower, the political will, to say, but we need to shut this down. Uh, 
Last I checked, it was over 300 million U.S. dollars in, in gold that these people dig up. Um, it all gets smuggled uh, to China, either as jewelry or as, as bars. Uh, it's, it's all illegal. It's all a criminal enterprise. Uh, you know, there's, there's, in effect, gangsters involved. They ride out in their Russian jeeps with, you know, submachine guns and pick this stuff up and bring it back to the Ukraine, buy off the politicians. It's a terrible, awful business. It's completely removed from the mining I'm talking about, obviously. It's, it's an illegal, small-scale kind of operation. It's extraordinarily dangerous to people involved, and it's a social nightmare. So, I don't know. Okay. I, I think I said it nicely. I wasn't working up on it, but it's a, it's a horrible problem, really. I think we have time for one more question, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, in Mongolia, it's North Korea is that people who have money or people who know other people um, get their way. Um, so with the American University, mm -hmm. how are you going to make sure that the best caliber of students get in? I can start there. Well, for our university, that's easy. We just operate transparently, and you just don't do it any other way. So I did at Hanbank 12 years ago. I mean, as, as everybody here who's familiar with Mongolia or Mongolia knows, when you, when you come through you know, like something like the Communist era, there's no transparency. You have no rights to anything. What you what you have is your friends and family network uh, that protects you. That's the people you know. And how you if you have a dispute with somebody, you get the highest authority you can from wherever you can and make that work. And and everybody did their best to get better education for their kids, better apartments, more food, whatever. And and you do it non-transparently. You trade some asset of the state that you happen to have for some other asset of the state that the state owned everything, right? <coughs> um, and that spirit, unfortunately, has carried over. The bank, even though it's a 100% private bank, uh, is sort of a proxy for the, the government. So it's sort of okay to steal. If you can get away with it, it's okay to do a non-transparent deal to make some transaction with somebody or hire somebody's relative in exchange for something else. These kind of things just go on. You know, we adopted policies that said, no, if you take a bribe, you get fired. If you pay a bribe, you get fired. If you hire a, a relative without telling us, you get fired, and we'll send you to the police in most of those cases. Did we stop all of it? Of course not, 4,500 people. Did we may take a very tough line on it? Yes. The public understood that and heard that. I mean, at the last count, even in the depth of the 08 problem, uh, the, the, the polls that we take said that 65% of my low people said that Hanbank was the safest bank in the country. And I think one of the major reasons for that is we were 100% transparent. And it, it, as I say, it wasn't, didn't work perfectly in every case. But nevertheless, that was our policy. That's the way we ran the place. And I think, I think in the end, that wins. In the case of the university, I mean, the people that are involved in this university just won't let it be any other way. I mean, we will have a transparent admissions process. Nobody's going to give us money in a paper bag. Everybody knows that's the way it works with other scholarship programs. In Mongolia, you know, parents have to pay five or ten thousand dollars to file an application for some of these official scholarships, and, and more if the kid gets in. Maybe some of you've been through that. Uh, but in our case, it's simply, you know, we're in charge of the university, and we just won't let it happen. Well, on that, um, I guess, optimistic note, uh, <coughs> that, uh, that include, I'd like to also mention that those of you interested in mining um, and the issues that are uh, 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 relevant to mining in the future in Mongolia, on October 20th, um, the Century and Study Society will be having its annual meeting at Indiana University, and there will also be the Mongolia Society to organize a concurrent panel with that on mining, uh, which will also, we'll also be showing a documentary uh, film on the topic, Mongolia Mining Challenges and Civilization. So uh, we hope uh, some of you will be able to um, uh, join us at that. With that, I'd like to also join me in thanking uh, Pete Morrow for an absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you.